know what you think I'm going to say, <laughs> but I'm not going to say it. You know why? Because we are to walk humbly. <laughs> he chose that just for you. You know? <laughs> hey, if you're new with us, if we haven't met, my name is Austin and I serve as the pastor here and on behalf of our church and our team and our members and all the people that call this church home, we want to say welcome. Whether it's your first time, your tenth time, or you come every week, honored by your presence. A little extra honored today. And that's just because um, as I've been studying this week and uh, leaning into this sermon that I've been very vocally excited about, which I am, uh, I've been really challenged and convicted and drawn to the truth of like, there's so much value in spiritual community. And, and this, this week was a little hectic and crazy and I felt like I was going somewhere all the time as I'm trying to integrate into our community here. And I just had a few moments these last couple of days where I'm like, man, I'm really, really glad to be where I am. And to be doing what I'm doing. And um, I want you to know it's because of the people, it's not because of... Uh, anything else. So thank you for being awesome. And uh, God loves Ohio State football more than Iowa. Uh. <laughs> but, but I love you the same anyway. <laughs> and so um, there's just a value in community. And so uh, our church, we're aiming to do more things geared to and for our community and the community. So on October the 19th, that is a Saturday evening, as you heard earlier, we're going to have just a fall family night. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a good time. I want you to be there if you can be from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. There's a thing in your bulletin so you can save the date as well. Um, thank you to the Petersons for being uh, gracious enough to offer all their good things to, to love us and serve us and have a good time, so thank you guys. And then on Wednesday night, October 23rd, we're going to begin to do these more and more as they take more shape. We're going to have a, a prayer night at 6 p.m., and that's kind of come and go as you please. Don't expect it to be incredibly formal or anything like that. It's really just a time to gather and pray together, and so um, put that on the calendar as well. It's Wednesday, October 23rd, 6 p.m., and you know... If you've been around a little bit, that there's every so often I want to stop and I want to pray for another pastor in another church here in our community. We're going to do that today. We're going to pray for Pastor Bruce Smith and Mediapolis Global um, Methodist Church. There's a lot of M's in that, Mediapolis Global <laughs> Methodist Church. And so we're just going to take a moment before we get going and we're going to pray for Pastor Bruce and the Methodist Church here in town. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kingdom. Thank you for your body. Thank you that we are just one part of a greater thing you're doing in and through the earth. And so, God, today we pray for Pastor Bruce and his family. God, I know that ministry can be hard. I know that leadership can be tough. And I know um, there's a lot that goes into it that no one ever sees. So I pray more so for anything today for Pastor Bruce that he feels seen by God. And that he feels felt by God, Lord, that your, your presence be tangible to him equipping him for all he needs for this season of ministry. God, we pray for the church. We pray, pray, pray that you bless the church with all that they need, financially, staffing, people, whatever they need to fulfill the mission you've given them as a church here in this, this community. Thank you for making us one body with many members and many expressions. We love you, and we thank you that we get to serve in this capacity. So bless Pastor Bruce, his family, and the Methodist Church here in town. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. And anyway, today we're going to kind of circle back around. We're not in the middle of a, a teaching series or a book of the Bible yet. I want to give you a little look ahead. In two weeks, we're going to start a series. I don't know how long it'll go. Out of the Old Testament minor prophet Haggai. And so if you want some reading this week or the coming weeks, it's only two chapters. So if nothing else, you can tell someone, hey, I read a book of the Bible this week. It's going to take you about 12 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And so I want you to, to be in that for the next couple of weeks, really, really excited about what we're going to learn as we study the book of Haggai. But today, uh, it's kind of a one-off. It's not really connected to anything other than something we talked about a few weeks ago. If you've been around, we studied the book of Galatians, and we uh, had a, uh, a sermon that was geared around this idea of living fruitful lives. If you were here, do you remember that time that we spent talking about uh, that we're free in Christ to be fruitful, that we're free to bear spiritual Fruit. What I want you to hear this morning is that God wants your life to be fruitful. Okay? 
And that's not something that God wants from you. That's something that God wants for you. He does want it from your life, but He wants it for your life. The fruit that you produce, the spiritual fruit we produce, actually, yes, it's great for the world around us, but it's also great for us. Amen. <laughs> and so the fruit that God desires our life to bear or to bore is found in Galatians chapter 5, what we studied not that long ago, but I'm going to read the text again. Here's the spiritual fruit, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So to circle back onto this idea of fruitfulness, we're going to go to John chapter 15, if you have a Bible. John chapter 15. And here's what you need to hear. Without John 15, there is no Galatians 5. Hear me today. If we do not learn to apply this John 15 scripture that we are going to lean into today, you will never see Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, actually uh, flourish the way that it's designed in your life. I know that's a big statement, but I'm very confident that it's theologically sound. Okay? So what we're going to learn in John 15 is incredibly important to live a fruitful, not just a fruitful, a Christian life. Amen. Okay? So let's get some context to John 15 before we jump in, because context is king. Okay? In John 13 through John chapter 13 through chapter 17, it's known as what is called the farewell dissertation or the upper room dissertation. Okay, it is the, the last supper. Jesus is gearing up for the cross, and he's not just gearing himself up, he's now uh, letting his disciples know that life is about to change. In this upper room, in, in upper room emphasis. What am I saying? <laughs> in this upper room, he would lay, sit down and he would wash the disciples' feet as if to tell them, hey, this is how you are to serve the world. He would be betrayed by one of his own named Judas Iscariot for a bag of silver. And then he's going to lean into this idea that we're about to hear in John 15 of what does it look like for you to be my disciple, talking to his 11 remaining, when I'm gone. Because right now, the world knows you're my disciple. Why? Because you walk with me. You talk with me. You do life with me. But I'm, I've got to go. And so how's the world, and how are you going to know you are my disciple? And so this teaching... Is incredibly applicable to us today. Why? Because Jesus is not physically here. It's here. Spirit is. But what we see in John 15 is almost the, the playbook on what is it like to be a disciple now that Jesus has ascended to heaven. Now, it's important for us to understand the magnitude of the moment. These disciples, many of them, left everything that they knew and loved to follow this guy. And Jesus is telling them, it's better for you that I go. I can imagine there's some confusion. I can imagine there's some tension in the room. I can imagine Peter's already planning on how he's going to beat up Judas later. Right? Yeah. Nobody laughed at that one. <laughs> Whatever, it's fine. I tried. So there's a lot of tension in the room. It's not just this cute little done-up teaching Jesus is giving. No. The disciples are undoubtedly in inner peril right now. They don't want Jesus to go. Their rabbi, their teacher, their leader, the guy that they left everything for is now saying he must leave them. And so let's not just breeze through John 15 thinking, oh man, what does this mean for me? And how, is this, how am I, how, like how does this apply to me? Let's, let's remember the greater picture here. That there were 11 men who dropped their lives, quite literally, to give everything to follow Jesus. Amen. And are being told that Jesus is voluntarily going to leave them. Because he must. Are you with me? This is a heavy moment in John 15, starting in verse 1. This is what it says. I am the true, everyone say true, true. vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. He takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Love that word, don't we? Yeah. 
Why does he prune it? Why? That it may bear more fruit. Verse 3 says, Already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. I'm reading from the ESV today. I love the language in the ESV in this text more. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm sorry, abide in me and I in you. The branch that cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Everyone say branches. Branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, in my words, everyone say words, words. abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified <laughs> that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, I love this, that my joy may be in you, as if to say, hey, I'm Jesus and I have joy to give. Jesus didn't hate His life. Isn't that good news today? <laughs> He's saying, I want my joy to be in you. And listen to this, not just a little bit, that your joy may be full. Man, I love that. That's like a 35 to 7 W over oh. a team. <laughs> I'm so humble. I'm so humble. I'm so humble. <laughs> I want, to, I want you to write this down if you take notes. The title of my sermon today is this, Abiding Branches. Abiding Branches. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that church is fun. Thank you, thank you for community. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for what you've produced in and through our lives. Thank you that you're just getting started. Thank you that the best is yet to come. Thank you that you have grown us, you have stretched us, you are requiring us to take steps out of what we've always done to step into more of you. You're growing us, you're producing fruit through us, and we thank you that you are good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Use your word now to draw us to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> I want to reread the first five verses of our text. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remember, he's talking to the disciples. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do Nothing. Now, when Jesus calls himself the true vine in verse 1, the disciples' ears would perk up. Here's why. Because contextually, in where, in where they were in the world, vineyards were very common. They probably walked by more than one vineyard each and every day. So, vineyards are a picture that when Jesus starts to talk about vines, that the disciples can quickly begin to visualize. Okay? But then the second reality is this. The second reason they would perk up is because... Growing up, they would have no doubt heard of Israel being called God's vine or vineyard. Okay? That's how God's people were referred to in some of the Old Testament and the prophets. Okay? And so if they, if they knew Isaiah, if they had ever heard some of the prophecy of Isaiah, which many of them undoubtedly had, they would hear God's people referred to as God's vine or God's vineyard, like we see in Isaiah chapter 5. I'm going to read you in a moment. But anytime they would hear that, it was almost exclusively in a negative light. Okay? So this is what Isaiah 5 says. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. I had all I needed. He dug it up and he worked it. He cleared it, out, cleared it of the stones and he planted it with the choicest vines. And he built a watchtower in it and he cut out a wine press. He did everything 
needed to be done. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. The nation of Israel at that time was producing bad fruit. In Isaiah chapter 5, what was going on is great idolatry in the land. A dedication or a commitment to people rather than God. Okay? Idol worship was running rampant. There was nothing being produced in God's people that pointed to God's goodness. And that's when we know we're off course. Is anything in my life pointing to the goodness of God? Because ultimately that is what spiritual fruit does. Is that it points us, it points others to the goodness of God in and through someone's life. Amen. Are you with me today? Yes. But why were they producing bad fruit is the question. And why do sometimes we look at parts of our lives and we think to ourselves, why is what's being produced here only bad? And here's the truth. The source we connect our lives to determines the fruit we produce. God's people throughout time and history have deeply struggled with being satisfied in the right source. Being content to abide. Getting to Jesus and really believing and living as though he is enough. Everyone say enough. There's a great temptation now, probably more than ever, to look for what we need in all the wrong places. Where do we go when we need something? When I need to escape, do I go to a bottle? When I need pleasure, do I go to a website that I shouldn't? When I need rest, do I rest in the right things? Are you hearing me today? Where do I go when I need something? That, my friend, is your source. That's the well you're drawing, the water that nourishes your life good or bad, from. The source matters so much. When we connect to the wrong sources like Israel, we see bad fruit. But when we connect to the right source, singular, connect to the true vine, we like a branch become fully dependent upon that vine for all the nutrients we need to have anything produced spiritually in and through our lives. What does a branch do on a vine? It sits there. You hear me today? There is no life in a branch that's disconnected from the vine. None. So when we start to lean into this teaching of Jesus, it's important for us to remember the relationship that Jesus is defining with his disciples. He didn't say like a mother and a child. Okay? Why? Because a child will find a way to survive for a little bit. Okay? He didn't say a fish and water, right? Why? Because a fish can survive for just a little bit without water. He says a branch and a vine. Why? Because the minute the branch is severed from the vine, there is no life in it. Amen. The minute the branch falls from the vine is the minute the branch is dead. It is that dependent of a relationship. Are you with me today? I don't know, I got way ahead of myself there. Now I've got to backtrack, sorry. So Jesus is telling his disciples that the life of a disciple finds its source in him, in Jesus. You hear me today? That that is the source in which real life is produced. Jesus has no interest in being an addition or a supplement to your life. No interest. Jesus is not a pre-workout drink that you take for more energy, right? Jesus is not a side hustle that you work for more money. Jesus has zero interest in being something that you just add to your life. And he's telling the disciples, like he's telling us today, I have to be the source for you to abide in me, remain in me, be and live in me. I must be the source that you run to. Like a branch in a vine. Discipleship is the way of dependence. 
You want to grow spiritually? Yield more of your life. Give something up. Right? Ask God to take something from you. The way of discipleship is the way of learning dependence, full dependence on Jesus for everything that we might need. And what you need to know today is that you're not just left hung out to dry to try to figure this out. Everyone say vine dresser. dresser. God is a good and trustworthy vine dresser. You see, when we get into John 15, the temptation for us is to talk about pruning and to talk about all the things that have to do with us and all that. And and here's how we need to look at the Scripture every time we go to Scripture is, what is this going to teach me about the Father? That's what we need to lean into and even here. Uh, God is a good and trustworthy vine dresser. Verse 2 says that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, he being God, the vine dresser, God the Father, takes away... And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Listen to me. The language here in verse 2 is so important. Jesus says, every branch that is in me, everyone say in me, that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Hear me today. It's possible to be a fruitless Christian. What Jesus is not saying is that if there's no fruit in your life, I'm just going to get rid of you. Okay? It's really easy to interpret in our English language that way. To think like, oh, Jesus is saying, if there's no spiritual fruit in my life, then he's just going to get rid of me. I'm out. I've been cut off. Like, that's the end of No, no, no. He's saying, those of you who are in me, meaning we are in Christ, we have given our life to Jesus. Here, fruit takes time. Fruit takes work. Fruit doesn't just happen. It's important to understand the phrase takes away there in its original language. It's the word aero. Everyone say aero. Aero. And it means to raise, to take up. Or to lift. I love this because this, this scripture, if you just read it in our English language, we think, oh no. And all of a sudden we lean into what Jesus is actually saying. And what we see is that God knows when it's time to lift us up. Because in a vineyard, as the branch would bear fruit or if things would grow on it, it gets heavier and heavier. And in a vineyard, what you see is all these branches and vines propped up everywhere. Why? Because things cannot flourish on the ground in a vineyard. Some, sometimes as, as things start to grow on it, it will weigh down. And a good vine dresser knows when it's time to reposition the branches. When it's time to lift the branches up. When it's time to arrow the branches. Are you hearing me today? Amen. And some of us in here today... Look at our lives and look at areas where there is no fruit. And we can begin to question, am I even in him at all? Now, you've got to work through that. But I'm going to tell you today, if you are in him, he will lift you up. And he not only will he lift you up, he will do it for his glory. A good vine dresser knows when to lift things up. And in the same way, a good vine dresser knows when to prune. That one didn't get as many amens and I didn't really expect it. <laughs> the word for prune is the word kathero. It means to make clean by purging, removing undesirable elements. See, as in a grapevine in a vineyard, extra things will grow. Unnecessary things will grow. And as those things grow on those branches and weigh them down, those fruitless things, if, as they accumulate, will weigh down the branches to the point where it's on the ground and it cannot flourish. And so the vine dresser, again, knows when it's time to lift, but he also knows when it's time to cut. Have you ever been there? Sometimes God loves you enough to cut things off from your life. That is not his punishment to you. His heart in that is not to harm you. He does that Because he loves you and he knows what's good for you. Are you with me today? Yes. We should thank God every day for the things that he has taken from us that were never designed to be a part of us. Right? And I know the temptation here is to think relationally or maybe it was a person. And a lot of that is, some of that's true, but a lot of that's just birth from unhealed wounds that we have. Sometimes God prunes things that you love. 
And sometimes the vine dresser gets close to that thing. He's like, ah, 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 ah. I only trust you until you start messing with that. Are you hearing me today? Don't just think in terms of people that have hurt you. That's very real. Okay? But that's not all the Bible's talking about. Like, this thing is not all about us. Amen? Amen. It's for us. It's used for us to make us more like Christ. But pruning is a gift. A painful gift. You hear me today? Praise God for the things He takes away. Praise God for the things He gives. Praise God for lifting. When I needed lifted. And man, we like the lifting. That's very hopeful. It's very good. Like, God, you are a good vine dresser. Lift me up. And he starts cutting. And he's, ow! <laughs> but God knows what needs removed. So that his people can flourish. And that they can bear much fruit. Why? Because he's a good and trustworthy vine dresser. A dependent branch will come to love and trust the hand of a good vine dresser. Because what becomes evident is that the vine dresser not only knows what he's doing, but he's doing it for us. I know it can hurt. I know it can be painful. I know sometimes we let things like grow on our lives that begin to weigh us down. And we're getting closer and closer to the ground, right? You ever met a Christian who just is in a season or a time where they're just down and out? Isn't that a hard, hard story to sit back and watch? And I've been that Christian. Anyone else been that Christian where my life is just hanging on by a thread, it seems. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, for some reason, God uses something, some person, something. And before I know it, God is lifting me and my spirits begin to lift and my gaze begins to lift. And I'm reminded of how good... And how, how much kindness this vine dresser has displayed in my life. Amen. And then there's other times where it feels like I'm bleeding out because God has cut things from me. And it is in those times, it is in those times when the Bible says, this will prove that you're my disciples. What? That you remain in him through both. Amen. Loving or a dependent branch will come to love and trust the hand yes. of the vine dresser when he lifts, when he cuts, because he's good. God is a good gardener. You know, like the first book of the Bible. That was a pretty good place, wasn't it? And as we come to love the hand of the vine dresser, the, but like loving the hand of the vine dresser empowers us to abide in him. To remain in it. Everyone say abide. abide. It means to remain. And this is where our choice has a part to play. We don't get to choose what the vine dresser does. We don't get to choose the elements we might encounter. We don't get to choose the conditions we may have to endure. We get to choose whether or not we will remain. It's kind of like you can't control the weather. You can simply control what you're going to wear out in the weather. Right? You, you get to choose at the end of the day whether or not I'm going to live a life of abiding in him or I'm not. When he's lifting and when he's cutting, a disciple rec is recognized by his or her abiding. And as much as we should desire fruit bearing, and we should, the truth is that you are not responsible to produce fruit. Amen. It takes time. You are not the source. Every part of your life, of your spiritual life, flows from the true vine. Therefore, our focus, our aim, what we, the target we aim to hit every day in our life is to abide in Jesus. And the fruit will come. You want more self-control? Abide in Jesus. You want more love and joy? Of course we do. Amen? Anyone else? I love some joy. I love some joy. I've been watching Inside Out. I love some joy. How do I get that joy? I get that by abiding in Jesus. Failing to abide in Christ is failing to be fully alive. Amen. And God, He offers life. Fruit. 
Fruit comes in our abiding. So focus on abiding. Spend your time. Gear your life. Study your Bible. Pray your prayers from a posture of abiding in Jesus. Let's continue in our text. Verse 6 says this. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burnt. See, here's where it's a little bit different than verse 2. He's saying people who, like those who are not in me, they will go and they will wither. They have no life. Therefore, all there is to do with dead branches is what? Burn it, right? And so verse 7 says this, if you abide in me, in my words, I love this so much, my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. We will get to that in a moment. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so you prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. He didn't say, I will love you. This is how I love you now. Keely gave me that look like, quit yelling. <laughs> abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. He turns to his 11 remaining disciples. And he says, if your words, or if my words abide in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. We need to really, really bring some clarity to this because if you are not a maturing or growing believer, it doesn't take long for you uh, to realize that sometimes I pray things and I do not get good answers. Right? Sometimes I pray things. I've been praying for that new car for like seven years, you know. Sometimes we pray things and they don't get answered. Answer prayers are often connected to God's word abiding in you. Because God's word is alive and active. And as you let the word of God, right, your Bible, live inside of you, your desires, your hopes, your dreams, your pursuits begin to be transformed. The longer the words live in our lives and they are active in our lives, they purify what we pray for and how we pray for it. It's almost like this life, as we depend on Jesus, we lean into God's word. What happens is we start to pray like Jesus prayed. Amen. And God never heard a prayer from Jesus that he didn't like. You hear me today? Mm. Yes. That the Bible is alive and active. And it will transform us from the inside to the outside. To where our prayers just echo the prayers that Jesus has already prayed. Isn't that good news? You want an answer prayer? Pray what Jesus prayed. <laughs> you hear me today? Yeah. Listen, God hears all of our, he says, bring all your requests to me. You can pray about anything. You can pray about your football team. You can pray about whatever you want. But if you want a prayer to be answered, align your heart with God's heart and pray what Jesus would pray. Yes. And a lot of times what you'll learn is that in the midst of that, when I'm praying for God to do something, right? Or I'm praying, God, I need you to work in this way in my life. What if that prayer just shifted, God, would you change me to be more like you in the midst of whatever it is that I'm navigating? Yes, this is my desire, but, but also remind me of your desire in this. Right? Psalm 37, we love this verse on a coffee mug or a social media post. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires. <laughs> you love that verse? You know what he's saying? Delight yourself. That word delight in its original language means to be pliable clay. It means to be in the presence of Jesus, willing to be changed. And then what happens? He will take your desires and he will put his in you. He will literally give you the desires of your heart. We don't pray prayers and then God answers and just says yes. You know why? Because God knows that will ruin your life. That's right. There's no dependence in that. That's pop machine Christianity. In my prayer, out my pop. Let's go. And God has way more for our life than that. Yes. I feel like I am preaching today. <laughs> that word delight means pliable, like, like wet clay in the hands of a potter. Scripture refers to this analogy of the potter and the clay, often in the Old Testament, a little bit in the New, where... The picture is a potter at the wheel and then the clay is, is being turned into something. 
And when we abide in Jesus and when his words abide in us and we spend time in his word and we spend time in prayer and we do it from this posture of delight, what happens is God changes us and turns us into who we are meant to become. Your life as a believer is a series of becoming. You will continually be becoming. There's no such thing as a mature Christian, only maturing Christians. You know why? There's no end in sight, guys. Amen. This is a lifelong journey you are on. I've got to move on. <laughs> but what is required when it comes to prayer and God's word? What, is our, what are we giving for that? It's, it's time. Because every relationship requires time. To abide in Jesus is to give him your time. We all got plenty of that to throw around, don't we? Oh, yeah. It's almost like if the enemy could do anything to you, it's fill your schedule. Because he knows the difference for you is whether or not you abide. So are we gearing our life? Listen, let's take some responsibility for our own schedules. Come on. I know you're busy. I know life's full. I know it's crazy. I know it's hectic. Mine, too. But let's abide in Jesus. Let's spend time. Let's be a church full of people that spend time in his word so we're not relying on some 33-year-old preacher that is trying his best for our spiritual growth. I'm dead serious. I'm not joking. Don't rely on me or some podcast or some radio program or anything else for your spirit. Abide in Jesus. Verse 9 says that as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. I know I'm going over time. I'm trying here. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Jesus loves his disciples like God loves Jesus. The way the Father loves the Son is the way the Son loves his disciples. Yeah. Think about that. And that's the offer for a believer. Mm. Not just a believer, a disciple. Come on. Those who follow him, this is the offer on the table. And some of us haven't sat and received the love of God in a long time. And my prayer for you this week is that God gives you one moment, just one moment, where all of a sudden it hits you, God actually loves me. Not that he will love me if, not that he loved me when, not that he loved me when I was way more spiritual, when things were good and I had a, my finances were in line, I was treating my... Kids, great, and all that. When, every, when everything was all together, I knew then that God loved me. No, no, no. God loves you right now. Amen. Amen. And He loves you the way that the Son loved the disciples. God loves you. He agapes you. He knows you're incapable of reciprocating the love that He gives to you. And He loves you anyway. Abide in His love. We abide how? By Receiving God's love daily. Stop for a moment. Say, God, thank you that if nothing else today, I can walk away and know that you love me. Yes. And our life can look so different just with that phrase. And not just with the phrase, but with the belief and the conviction in our heart that God does in fact love me. I know you got a long way to go. Me too. But he loves you. Dad, go and he loves you. Verse 10. And then I'm going to conclude. Verse 10 says this. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Right? He's telling us how to do it. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments, abide in his love. We abide in Jesus by simply obeying. Simply obeying. Let's not get all complicated with obedience. Okay, guys? What's Jesus asking me to do right now? And let's go do it, baby. Amen. Let's respond. The Bible's full of them. If you're looking for something to do spiritually this week, just read any Jesus parable and you'll have like seven things you can go try that week. That's right. You hear me? That's why time in God's Word, time in prayer matters so much. But then to take the action step from it going from our hearts to our hands that we would simply obey it in our life. The pathway set before us to abide is to spend time with Jesus be loved by Jesus and respond by simply obeying Jesus. That is a life of abiding. Amen. The gospel is simple, guys. 
Following Jesus can be difficult and hard, but the gospel is simple. Amen. To become a disciple, it can be hard and difficult, and it will bring challenges, but it's simple. The pathway has always been the same. Abide in Jesus. In your workplace, abide in Jesus. In your home, abide in Jesus. In your struggles, abide in Jesus. In your successes, abide in Jesus. In your relationships, abide in Jesus. You're hearing me today. So let's conclude with this. John 15, 11, the best verse of the lot for me. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. I would love some more joy. We've already talked about that. Here's what I take from this text. Being vaguely committed to Jesus and not abiding in him might be the most miserable place on earth to be. You know why? Because to be someone who believes in God or loosely believes in Jesus but is not committed to him, you don't love sin enough to enjoy it. And you're not abiding in Jesus enough to love that either. And so you're just like wandering around your life looking for home. No wonder we run to the wrong, wrong sources. And so if I'm just loosely committed, I'm just kind of in, I'm just dipping my toes in the water. I ran out of analogies here. That was a bad one. <laughs> halfway in, halfway out might be even worse than being all the way out. The life of a non-abiding believer is empty and void of the fruit God wants to give him or her. Yes. <laughs> so I'm not asking do you believe today. I hope you do. If you're a believer in the Son of my voice, here's what I'm asking you. Gear your life to abide in Jesus. Change anything you've got to change to abide in Jesus. And if you're doing it right now, keep abiding in Jesus. Don't be halfway in. Don't be halfway out. Because you won't feel at home in either place. The life of abiding in Jesus ultimately produces joy to the full. That's the result. Joy to the full. The life of abiding can be summed up in pretty much one quote. And then I'm going to pray and then we're done. You were designed to be with Jesus before you are to ever do for Jesus. God wants the fruit. Amen. Amen. He wants to give us the fruit. He'd much rather have your heart. So today, I'm going to be a little more passionate and I'm going to look at this church that calls me pastor you call this church home today if you don't you can consider this but if you do my challenge to you is this today go all in with him or don't God's call is all in. A life of abiding. When I say all in, that doesn't mean you have to sell all your possessions today. Go across the country unless God calls you. Don't have to do that. It just means love your family. Being all in with Jesus. It means going to work, being all in with Jesus. I'm abiding in Jesus. I'm living a life of abiding. I'm not halfway in. I'm not halfway out. I'm in. And I will abide in Him. I will spend time with him. I will give myself to him. I won't worry about the fruit. I know the fruit will come so long as I abide in him. So today, if we could all just bow our heads and close our eyes, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Don't worry. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands or anything weird. We're going to spend 30 seconds in silence. We're going to ask Jesus to speak to you. Father, we commit now to rid ourselves of the, the elementary ways in which we've followed you. We choose now to repent of complicating your gospel 
and discipleship. And we turn our hearts, our minds, all of us, to a life of abiding in Jesus. That our doing comes out of our being. That the fruit is because of the vine. Thank you for being a vine dresser. We ask now that you would lift those of us who need lifted, that you would cut away that which needs cut away, individually and collectively as a church body today. And we ask that we would be proven as your disciples by the fruit that you produce in and through our lives. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.